we are going to start with a small experiment this time. So listen to the prompts and then make your decision. Please guess the country of origin of the following excerpt of music. <laughs> So keep your answers to yourself for now. We'll come back to this a little bit later. So the topic of today's show is sociolinguistics. Now, the vast majority of people listening to this quite rightly have never seen a picture of me. How does my accent affect the way you visualize me when I'm speaking? How does it affect the way you think I dress or my political opinions or the, what I have for breakfast? Well, a lot, if not all of that, comes down to sociolinguistics. And the bloke who's going to tell us about that is... Andrew Ewan McFarlane. Now consider his accent. How do you imagine him? I'll give you a bigger sample. I had done a degree in business at Glasgow University, which then led me to go and do a TEFL abroad mm -hmm. as a classic gap year taking student. By now, you've probably formed some kind of opinion about him based on what you've just heard, the words he chose, his background and how he sounds. But do you feel differently about him this time? After the TEFL, I ended up teaching in Latvia for a while, which then took me to Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, I thought, how can I earn more money? I'll go and do a master's degree in linguistics. How about this time? Did a master's degree in linguistics, did fairly well at it, I ended up doing a PhD with um, a social linguist out in New Zealand. Oh, okay. And that's my route into linguistics. Did he seem more or less likeable or successful the second time? So many factors are affecting how you perceive somebody socially. So let's start at the beginning. For people who are not familiar with sociolinguistics, what, what is it at its root? Sociolinguistics came out of a desire, mostly in the 1970s, to get away from looking at language as something that existed in a vacuum, something that was governed by rules and, mm -hmm. and formula, the kind of Chomsky approach. Right. And it wanted to really focus on languages socially situated, governed by different people, different contexts, societies, situations, ethnicities, genders, sexualities, all the different things that we know make up our interesting social lives mm -hmm. have all been shown to affect the language we use, how we use it, how we switch back and forth between them mm -hmm. and getting away from an, any ideas of there being a universal type of mm -hmm. language that humans use. Right, right. Uh, and you're saying switch, switching back and forth, back and forth between what? It can be back and forth between different languages. For example, if you're bilingual, you can mm -hmm. switch between using Cantonese and English. So, you, um, And that's something I experienced in Hong Kong. The, the kids would um, speak English and they might switch into Cantonese if they just forgot a word, or they might switch into Cantonese mm -hmm. um, even with bilingual speakers just because of aspects of their identity. Right. But it can also be switching back and forth between certain accents or if you want dialects. So I can switch very much into a broad Glaswegian if I go back into a taxi in Glasgow. Right. My right. accent now would end up sounding something more like that, <laughs> uh, just so a taxi driver thinks I'm local. Right. Um, uh, but then if I speak in front of a lecture theatre in York, it's mm -hmm. much more like this. Okay. Um, and it can be switching also um, the kind of register you use. You speak differently to children as you do to adults for, mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. And a, um, so a register is the, the level of language, right? The sophistication or the politeness. Well, yeah, you can you know, register you can think of as a sort of sophistication. So you've got animal register, baby register, um, also registers that you would use to speak to a judge. Right. <laughs> um, which would be a different register than I would use to speak to a criminal. Right, okay. Yeah. I love animal register. That's the first time I've heard that. Yeah, speaking to a dog. You right. typically don't speak to them as you would a friend. No. <laughs> um, but it's, 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 a, it's a valid use of language. Uh, anything yeah. else that you're switching between? You're switching between variants. So social linguists are massively interested in the variation of variants, and I'll, I'll expand on that. So you can say one, two, three, or one, two, three. So using th or th, it's called th fronting in social linguistics. Mm -hmm. And many people exist in life using both of those. Mm -hmm. And where previously it might have been thought as random or bad speech, mm -hmm. we've realized that 
many people across the social spectrum, probably predominantly working class, but I, I use it and I'm probably middle class. And it's governed by rules and, and it's systematic, just like everything else in languages. So I probably more likely to say one, two, three to a young working class Londoner mm -hmm. and say three in a lecture context. But social linguists like to drill down on these variants. Another example might be glottaling your teas, butter versus butter. Uh, so as much as I'd like to think that I don't glottal, I do, <laughs> I definitely do, but it's systematic, it's governed by rules. So a social linguist wants to find out what those rules are, can we predict mm -hmm. in what context, in what situations are you going to glottal, use th rather than th, say mm -hmm. singing rather than singing, mm -hmm. and the list goes on. Right, right. So how, how far is that a, a conscious choice? Now that's something that's currently under quite a bit of debate, probably more in the social psychology side, but ling linguists are interested in that question as well. Mm -hmm. It can be completely under the level of awareness. So if I say butter in natural conversation, it's completely below my level of awareness. Mm -hmm. But if I'm speaking to somebody in a formal situation and I have to plan my speech a bit more, then it might come up into deliberate choice. Mm -hmm. kind of realm but a better way of looking at that would be it exists on a on a continuum of consciousness to uh, shouldn't really call it unconsciousness because that's what you are when you're being knocked out but um, <laughs> below your your yeah. awareness and, and it's a continuum but you could safely say that most of these things are automatic and non-deliberate how does this develop and how how, yeah. how how does your repertoire of this yeah, de develop? Does, yeah. Starts off with your peer group mostly. Your, mm -hmm. um, so you grow up speaking more like your friends than you do like your parents. So we've mm -hmm. got an example in this department of, of a young girl who's a, a daughter of academic members of staff and, and they're trying, none of them, neither of the parents have Yorkshire accents and they're also trying to get her to speak Arabic, but she sounds exactly like her friends at school. Right. Um, so spending multiple hours a day with people with a particular accent, mm -hmm. at least in childhood, is going to lead to you having an accent very much like that. That's not the case in adulthood, as we know that if you move to Korea in your adult life and you're from York, you probably won't end up sounding Korean. Right, yeah, yeah. Or speaking with a Korean accented version of English. Yes, yeah. Um, so it usually happens at the formative stage of your development. But changes happen all the time. So after three years in New Zealand, um, my lexicon changed a bit. So rather than saying Chris, I said chips and I still say chips. It's one of the last things that I can't shake off of okay. New Zealand. But in terms of vowels, consonants, accent differences, yeah. nothing I, I really? think has, has you remained. You say chips? Not unless I was trying to annoy New Zealanders, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Possibly, the, so frequency has a big effect as well. The more frequent a word is, mm -hmm. the more likely you are to adopt the predominant version of that. So in New Zealand, you would say yes a lot, but it'd be yes or ye. Yes. So probably in the course of living there, I did alter my vowel to word mm. ye because it's such a frequent word. Right. But in a word that had the same vowel, but it was very infrequent, for example, yesterday, I, I can't imagine I ever said yesterday. yesterday. No. So it's about frequency of, of meeting. Fre frequency of hearing it and also frequency of producing it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something a lot of people, I think, forget is it's not just about hearing these things. You also have to be producing them with enough frequency. Um, you know, your articulators get trained and your articulators being your larynx, your, your lips, your tongue. Mm -hmm. um, the more they get used to seeing it in a particular way and your ears get used to hearing it in a particular way, probably the more likely you are to say it in that particular way. Can can you choose to change your accent, or is it always there for a kind of act? You can choose. Fake. Margaret Thatcher chose to change her accent, maybe not so much, but her voice. So mm -hmm. um, Mar young Margaret Thatcher, if you want to go on and listen to her on YouTube, you'll see sounded what a lot of people would say is more feminine, slightly higher pitched, slightly less authoritative sounding. And here that is from her early days. I've been so busy that I haven't had really much time to think about it. After all, I know I'm still only me, and so do my family. But I'm very much aware of the responsibilities 
and a little bit apprehensive. Who wouldn't be when you think of the names that I follow? But she managed with um, vocal coaching to actually lower mm. her whole pitch range. Let me answer that very deeply because I feel very strongly about it. The greatest divisions this nation has ever seen were the conflicts of trade unions towards the end of a Labour government. Margaret Thatcher in her power years sounds very different to Margaret Thatcher in her shopkeeper mm. years. So that was a conscious, deliberate choice. Um, other people have changed their accent because they want to be accepted, maybe um, as actors and actresses. They've grown up in, it could be the West Midlands, but they want to sound like they went to RADA, so they develop a received pronunciation accent. That's all deliberate. It would probably be more difficult to choose to sound something alien to you. Mm -hmm. So I could choose possibly to sound like I was from Edinburgh, but I can't imagine deliberately being able to sound as if I were Canadian. Okay. Yeah. Right. That would probably happen over a long time and automatically, if at all. Mm-hmm. So anything else that's kind of like a foundation of, of social... A foundation of social linguistics yeah. um, from the variationist approach, which is associated with the work of William Lebov mostly, mm -hmm. is that the variation we use is almost always governed by social factors. Okay. And not only is it governed by social factors, but it's constrained and it's predicted by and it's systematic. So it's not random. Mm -hmm. the, the words that we choose to say, and choose as an again a sketchy word because we don't know how much of it's a choice but we'll use it the words we choose to say the way we choose to say them the accent the dialect we're using there'll be reasons for it and it's the job of the social linguist to a find those reasons but b try and predict what would happen in the future mm. will certain accents cease to exist Right. Um, so at the moment there is a new variety in London called Multicultural London English which is associated with young black youth in London but it's been adopted by different ethnicities so right. British Asians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis right. and latterly lots of white youth in London So there's, um, and it's got what we call in social linguistics covert prestige so for general society it's okay. not prestigious it's seen as a, a sort of deficient but for that group in society, regardless right. of whether they're white, black or Asian, it's got covert prestige. So it's cool. It's got street cred. Right. And that's spreading outwards of London. You probably end up hearing it in Milton Keynes at some point in the future. Eventually. So it'll kind of it'll spread out. That's the prediction. And while that's happening, mm -hmm. natural prediction would be that some other accents or dialects would have to decrease right. As, right. as that increases. Yeah. Like I was hearing about the... Like in in I suppose what you call like prestigious English accent that the su sound was disappearing as in suit very few people yeah. yeah there was a an art critic an art historian called Brian Sewell so, yeah. who <laughs> was alive up until about a year ago and he was the media dubbed him the poshest man in Britain <laughs> and yeah he's a prime example of somebody who would say assume or suit mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's getting much rarer to hear that. And ex another example is the use of wh for words like what and which. Yeah. So my dad says what, which, but anybody younger than him really in Scotland no longer says that. So Wales the country and right. Wales the plural of the big sea creatures right. are the same for me. Yeah. But for him it'd be Wales and Wales. Wales. So that's dying out. So the prediction of a social linguist, or at least some social linguists would be that mm. given 20 odd years, nobody will say whales anymore right and that will be lost to history until such time in the future that some young trendy teenager thinks that's a cool way to say that word and it takes on a whole new life completely separate to the life it had in the okay. past so in the sense that they the when it's resurrected they don't necessarily know about the no, previous it could, existence uh, absolutely it could be a completely separate process mm -hmm. that happens for very different reasons than 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 the previous use of that variant yeah right um, i imagine that that spread was a lot slower pre-internet but has the internet like expanded or increased the speed on the internet changes? doesn't seem to have a great effect on what we would call phonological change Phon phonology being your vowels and your consonants the way you speak so accent being something that's governed by your phonology mm -hmm. 
what the internet does seem to have an effect on is the speed at which various words and um, sort of lexical changes happen. Okay. Um, so in, in, in using a word such as, oh, what do the youth say these days? <laughs> lit is an example that I've been hearing uh -huh. a lot by our students. If something is lit, it's great or amazing or something. Right. Right. So the speed at which those words can go from not just from city to city, but kind of global and become buzzwords of the youth, right. the internet definitely has an effect on the speed that that can happen at. Whereas in, in the past, it would have taken people traveling abroad, mm -hmm. in, interacting with people, hearing it on in, in the movies, um, but that can happen much quicker now, but probably not affecting people's phonology at any deep level. Although okay. there is debate, there's debate as to whether TV changes our accent. It's an unsettled debate currently. Right, right. Because there was debate about whether the uh, the kind of rising intonation, like the what sometimes referred to as like an Australian yeah. rising intonation, whether that was actually from exposure. Start well, there was a claim that it started in the eighties when the soap opera Neighbours was kind of getting hugely popular. more popular. Yeah, and there's been similar things about whether or not the rise of th fronting that saying think rather than think right. comes from shows like EastEnders. The one argument against it is that very few, or at least a significantly lower proportion of young people now watch shows like EastEnders. Right. They're, so whether or not that's a, a good predictor of change is, is it's debated. So I can't say that TV or movies do, mm -hmm. do affect language. I'd be, I'd be hung up <laughs> if I said one thing or another. Right, okay. Before we started, you said that your approach is kind of a bit unusual in, in this kind of field. Unusual because I came into it via business and then laterally my PhD was in psychology. So I'm very keen to know whether or not hearing all this variation, hearing somebody saying think and singing or arcs rather than ask in the case of multicultural London English, mm -hmm. would that actually affect your behaviour? So in psychology, there's been loads of work showing that if you people see a black face rather than a white face or a fat person rather than a thin person that might have consequences for the food they they choose in a cafe so if you've just encountered a fat person walking out of a cafe would you be more likely then to choose the salad or if you have just seen a black person coming out of a police station would you be more likely to presume that they're the criminal rather mm. than a, a police officer or a lawyer right. so i want to know if you've just heard certain variants or certain modes of speaking could it affect your behavior your choice behavior whether or not you chose to cross the street mm -hmm. um an experiment i ran had people listening to an old speaker and a young speaker and you could hear that they were identifiably younger or older okay. and kind would, of lo looser vocal cords yeah kind of cre creaky we'd call it sort of yeah. creaky and sort of um it's a new zealand speaker so it was sort of like this <laughs> and then a young new zealand speaker and i wanted to see if that could slow them down in a reaction time test on a computer and it okay. did so hearing an older speaker slowed down the younger participants uh -huh. but hearing an older speaker sped up the older participants don't know why that's that's a theory in progress because work in psychology had shown that people who had completed a word puzzle task, group A had words related to being young and youthful and group B being old and sort of decrepit. <laughs> and when they left the experimental room, those who had had the old words walked more slowly than wow. those who had had the young words. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, if you can do that with word puzzle searches, why not do it with voices? So if you've just heard a very old sounding person, might that make you slow down a bit or stoop? Right. So that's the kind of questions I want to explore a bit more. Okay. So the consequences of variation outside of language choice and change. Right. Yeah. Uh, but there's there's no understanding of why that happened. Is it like the, some kind of rapport almost? Rapport is what you would use as your explanation if there were real people in the task. So if I was speaking to an older person right. and I slowed down, rapport would seem to explain that okay but if i'm hearing an old voice over headphones and there's there's no old people around and it's somehow slowing me on a on a, on a task it's a bit harder to sell rapport as the explanation unless mm. it's conditioned rapport it's something you've, you've grown up being told with a given type of person you should adjust your behavior towards them whether they're elderly or young mm. um or disabled so then if you're given a stimuli that 
activates the concept of old, young or disabled. There's a, a kind of hangover effect that your behaviour changes even if that person's not there. And okay. there's been some work done in psychology showing that people actually um, try to accommodate to robots, even <laughs> though logically wow. they know that the robot has no feelings or has no need to have a rapport built with them, right. but that they will alter their behaviour to suit the style of the robot. Really? Yeah. That's very unusual. Yeah. Yeah. So in the in the tests of responding to the, the the audio stimuli, did the age of the participant make any difference? Yeah. So only young people were slowed by the older voice, and only old people were sped by the older voice. Okay. So it was kind. Of, our predictions were: no matter your age, you'll be slowed down by hearing an old voice, but it only worked for the younger participants. Hmm. So. It might be that old people are more familiar with hearing older voices, so that right. makes them a bit more comfortable in the task. Yeah. The, the, there's about three or four competing ideas as to why it might happen, but I don't know which it is yet. Okay. Um, another experiment I ran asked people to listen to a very bizarre sounding clip of music. Um, and the voice that introduced the music was either a female New Zealander, a Scottish male, an old male New Zealander, a Chinese male mm -hmm. or a gay New Zealander. There was different conditions. And Andrew was kind enough to give us one of those stimuli. Please guess the country of origin of the following excerpt of music. <laughs> I'd love to know your responses. So if you could tweet me at M-O-T-C-A-S-T, C -A -S -T, all one word, uh, what country did you think was the origin of that music? And if you could hashtag it M-O-T-E-S-O-L, I'll keep checking the responses and I'll build a little chart on the website so we can see what we all thought. Now let's see what Andrew found. Those that heard it in the New Zealand conditions thought the music was from all over the world. So you had Morocco, Kenya, Europe. Those who were introduced to the music by the Chinese male were much more likely to give East Asia. Mm -hmm. So Korea, China, Japan, sometimes going down into South Asia, Philippines and whatnot. So their brains, because they had no idea where this music was from, their brains are less with a massive search field and they need to somehow constrain that search <laughs> field. So the brains will use any available recent information. In that okay. case, I just heard a Chinese male this music is really weird, I'll go Chinese. Right. And that, so it really helped. Um, in psychology, they call that heuristics. It's mental shortcuts that you use to try and cut down your search time for right. coming up with answers. And the music was actually Beijing rap music in reverse. Oh, really? But even Mandarin speakers couldn't tell that. It was so random and bizarre. Yeah, so I, I did wonder about what kind of uh, criteria you had for choosing the music, like what instruments... Because obviously if it was bagpipes... Yeah, like, or if, be... if it's sitar music, even in reverse, it's yeah. still sitar music. It's no, that, that, this, this was rap music sung in, or rapped in Mandarin. Mm -hmm. um, and we tested it on, on a bunch of people in the institute that I was working in. And even the, yeah, the native um, Mandarin speakers had no idea that it was hmm. Chinese rap music. So, really? so yeah, you have to be careful about the, the stimuli you choose not to make it too, too obvious. Yeah. Um, and reversing... Speech is actually a very good way of masking where it's from. It's very hard to understand speech in reverse. Mm. But, um, it's almost impossible. How can we apply this, even just to our understanding of the, how we interact with the world or into situations? I think one thing people, particularly language learners or teachers, ought to be aware of is that there are consequences for the way you speak. It activates ideas in other people's head. The accent mm. you use whether it's a nice Southern posh RP accent, mm -hmm. if it's a Cockney London accent, if it's an American one, that tells this, the listener something about you. You're Even if you're not trying to portray an aspect of your identity, it's coming out in the speech signal. Mm -hmm. So from a language learning point of view, you need to decide what it is you want to portray about yourself. So it's not enough just to say, I should learn Queen's English, because mm -hmm. if your plan is to go and work in Edinburgh or Glasgow, that probably not a great variety to learn right. or and not great for you to understand it. And knowing when to use certain phrases and words in the right context, it's all socially conditioned. 
So I think just being aware that when you speak and when you listen, there are all these social signals being activated and you need to decide how to sort of navigate that social landscape. Yeah. Being aware of your, your accent or language prejudices, challenging them, also having a bit of fun with language, right. changing it in, in situations, um, being open to new varieties and new new accents, I think is really important. It'd just be so boring if everyone decided to speak RP. Yeah, All right. and it would last maybe a day before the variants would start. Yeah, you, you learn to speak RP and then you move to Birmingham. You know, I don't know how, it's not going to be long before your RP starts to get ruined <laughs> by the filthy Brummy accent, you know. And of course, it's not really filthy because social linguists don't take stances on accents. I mean, one of the interesting things is that it's completely arbitrary as to what accent people seem to like, and it's usually a comment on the speakers. So mm -hmm. there's no inherent reason why RP sounds any nicer than Aberdeen, for example. Right. But it's the RP is associated with wealth and city life, and Aberdeen mm -hmm. is associated with the cold fishing right. city. Or Russian is a quite negatively perceived accent, um, Russian English speakers. But it's because Russia currently has a negative global stereotype. Right. If Russia's stereotype was of a, an, an open, democratic, welcoming country, I'm sure people would mm. more like the accent than they do. Right. And, and I suppose on the flip side, the French accent is, you know, r romantic. Yeah, and... it's, no, it's no accent that French, Italian and Spanish, very well liked sounding languages, mm. happen to be spoken by gregarious, open, romantic, fun loving, fairly temperamental, if I'm for using stereotypes, people. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a comment on the speakers and, and society. It's not really mm. a comment on the accents or other languages themselves, because that's totally arbitrary how one thing sounds right. or another. Yeah, um, uh, and when you're saying like Russian accents, is that Russian speaking English? Or yeah, so a, a, a Russian speaking English with a it's what they use in movies to portray criminals. Yeah. And James Bond is a good example. There's been a number of baddies in James Bond who speak Russian accented English, mm -hmm. and and it's it's there because it's it activates all those stereotypes of right. corrupt, violent, undemocratic. Right. It's a shortcut. I guess, yeah, it's a shortcut. So, yeah, it's exactly that. You know, in the same way that whenever they're in France in a movie, they put accordions in the soundtrack. It just right. it gets the, the watch, the, the viewer there much more quickly right. than having to be true about modern right. France. Right. And, 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 and their its lack makeup. of accordions. Yeah, and their lack of, in Scotland, <laughs> and it's general lack of bagpipes, <laughs> apart from Edinburgh, which is full of bagpipes. But yeah, right. Right. Glasgow less. So, yeah. Any other kind of foundational elements? Social linguistics likes to break a lot of myths. Men don't speak all that differently to women, mm, really? vice versa. Um, so the idea is that women chat way more. It's mostly nonsense. Huh. That men are much more argumentative and difficult, being um, shown not to be true. It really depends on the context. So in the past, when women had jobs more like secretary, secretary and administrative posts and men were more like to be managers, it's no accident that when they went and analyzed their styles yeah. women were more deferential or or less and you know argumentative that that wasn't them being women that was them being in a junior post because right. there was still massive workplace discrimination but if you go and for example record a female football team and a female uh, and a male football team you probably wouldn't find many differences because the situation requires you to shout and to be argumentative and right. to and to make yourself heard um, so social ling linguistics trying to show that it's situations and context that are more important than very broad categories like male, female, or right. um, working class and middle class. Have you got any language myths that you think that your listeners would have that uh, you could comment on? Well, I guess there's one idea that, uh, <laughs> again, maybe because we're both British, we keep going back to this class kind of uh, well, but uh, the idea that like working class swear more than the middle class or the upper class. Again, probably dependent on context. Mm. I would imagine that in the confines of a Westminster bar where they're away from the media, MPs swear just as much as, you know, Dave and John the Builder down the King's Arms in right. Birmingham. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm using stereotypes to try and illustrate this quite quickly, but it probably has been research done on it, but I would imagine that they find that context is more important than broad macro things like class and... Right. And sex. I think that there has been work shown that women do swear less than men, mm -hmm. but it would be 
very very silly to imagine that that's anything biological right yeah there's nothing rather than the brain there's nothing hardwired for that Mm. if there are differences it's because women have been brought up to be more ladylike and that's probably changing as well yeah just kind of going on the different topic is there any kind of uh kind of really interesting but maybe unusual research that you've come across on anything well there's at least in the the area I'm in, there's a famous kiwis and kangaroos study, which was done in New Zealand, which was to see whether or not having a stuffed kiwi bird, Mm -hmm. symbol of New Zealand, or a stuffed kangaroo, symbol of Australia, could affect how people heard speech. Mm -hmm. So participants came into a room, and in that room there was a stuffed toy, kiwi or kangaroo, and they weren't directed to look at it, it was just in the room as a prop. And the researchers found that when they had to listen to Um, a stream of speech they thought the speech was more Australian sounding if the kangaroo was in the room Uh and more New Zealand sounding it's it's the same speech all the participants heard Uh, but the stuffed toy affected them so this is uh, this massive area called priming which is everything in your environment the sights, the sounds, the smells the the temperature all of that can have effects on your perception and your behaviour so getting away from really you know broad categories like sex, gender, class, ethnicity, and trying, I think the work now of social linguists or linguists in general, is to try and nuance that a lot more and get into what are some of the more subtle effects mm-hmm. that are operating on our speech and our perception. Right. Um, the brain can't make a decision in a vacuum, it needs stimuli to help it, uh-huh. and there's no reason to expect that a bunch of stimuli that haven't previously been thought of by scientists don't actually affect their behaviour, even if that's stuffed toys in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that to me, that's quite a, a new and exciting vein of research to try and show all the various weird, wonderful environmental stimuli that could be affecting mm-hmm. how we see, hear and interact with things. Right. And it can be as simple as one thing. Could be as simple as one thing, but probably interacts with a whole bunch of things. So getting a handle on this is is a very thorny topic at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. uh, there's a controversy about the extent to which you can replicate a lot of these experiments. That That's part of the, the excitement involved in it. Right. Um, so yeah, getting away from fairly easy questions like, do working class people use glottal stops more than middle class people and saying can we actually affect the amount they use a glottal stop based on some environmental stimuli? Like if there was a picture of skeg nests in the wall, <laughs> would that encourage them to use more glottals than if there was a picture of Buckingham Palace in the wall? Right. There's, an, there's an idea for an experiment for you. There you go. If wants to run it. <laughs> Let's find a, a picture of skeg nests. And then we get it up. Leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. You're Fascinating. welcome. Fascinating. Okay, so there you have it. A really fascinating interview. One of my favourites so far, actually. So, yeah, please tweet me at M-O-T-C-A-S-T, at M-O-T-C-A-S-T, with your country. Where did you think that music was from? And hashtag it M-O-T-E-S-O-L, and I'll check it out. Yeah, so I'm trying to be more active on Twitter, so I think this is a good start. I want to get a bit more interactive. Anyway, I'll catch you next time. See ya.